Hello, I'm Atuba George, and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Praise God. Before we go into today's broadcast, are you ready to make demand for your daily bread? Ready? Join me in faith right now and say, Father, I demand right now my daily bread. It's coming to me now in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Turn your Bibles with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 15. 1 Chronicles 1 6, verse 1 5. Got that right? It says, Remember his covenants forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Now, I, I you know last week we began to lay foundation for this subject we're talking about uh, right now, the covenant. And even yesterday, I, I sort of laid a kind of foundation into what we're going to be getting to this week you see david speaking here i pray my say my prayer for you is that god gives you understanding because understanding is not so easy to come by a lot of things you think you know and number two you've got to really stay close to the lord I understood something 10 years ago doesn't mean it's still the same way it should be today. See, my level of understanding 10 years ago can never be the same level of understanding I have today on the same matter. Now, it doesn't mean my level of understanding will now, or uh, my, my understanding will change from right to wrong. Sometimes it may because, I mean, you grow up to realize that what you thought it was before was wrong. You were looking at the false, um, or using a false yardstick to measure. Okay, like a lot of people do. I shared that with, that with you last week. So, so here, he was talking about a particular covenant. So he says, remember God's covenant. And he said, the covenant which he made with Abraham. Now, thank God for the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus rightly said, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Because I'm going to enter into some things that may offend some people. Yeah, I'm aware. But Jesus said the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Now that statement of Jesus, you don't know the importance of it until you begin to see the Holy Spirit do that in your life. He will make you step on things that I'm telling you. Sometimes in, in guiding you, he will take you through a very thin line. And you just have to walk on that line with him until you come out on the other side like, whoa, wow, praise God. I'm telling you the truth. The Holy Spirit guided. That's a prayer you must pray every day of your life and mean it. Desire his guidance. And mean that prayer. Holy Spirit, guide me into all truths that I need today. Now then, In general theology, you know, we have this argument of New Testament and Old Testament. And then we go further to say it's New Covenant and Old Covenant, okay? But see, David was the one speaking here and he says, hey, remember always, that's what he says, remember his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand, a thousand generations. Then he went on to tell you the particular covenant he's referring to. And he says, it is the one God made with 
Abraham. We've not really looked at the covenant that God made with Abraham. We've not sat down to dissect it. Now, there are two covenants that God made with Abraham. I, I, I've touched on that you know, previously. And I said we're going to go into details of these things um, in the coming days. And trusting the Lord who will begin to enter into these details. Number one was the covenant of sustenance, which was Titan. Titan was a covenant. And number two covenant God made with Abraham was a covenant of circumcision. These two covenants is what define the identity of Abraham's children. And everything God is going to do next, every other covenant that came up after that was because of this covenant. Titan circumcision. Now, in this series of teaching, I'm going to add one more covenant, and that's the one Jesus made. And that's the one of breaking of bread. We'll get to that one. So these are the three covenants that we are majoring on. And, and I'm going to show you how important they are. And despite how people have tried to twist things around. And, and see, that's why I said the Holy Spirit is the one who will guide you into all truth. So God made these two covenants with Abraham. And the, the first thing you want to ask yourself is, why? Why? Why the covenant of tithing? Why the covenant of circumcision? I'm sharing this with you because there is, not even today, it started even from the book of Acts. For example, the covenant of circumcision. You find out where they they almost took it out. Why did they take it out? Or why did they, you know, they had this conference in, in Jerusalem where they, they got in and they began to discuss because some folks have come to say, oh, the Gentiles, because the Gentiles were getting saved, they need to be circumcised. Okay. And then so they, they sent some people, Barnabas and Paul, to Jerusalem to sort out these matters. And Barnabas and, and Paul were of the opinion that we don't need them to be circumcised. But then when they got to Jerusalem, I, I want you to study that thing carefully. When they got to Jerusalem, the, they made a broader call concerning the law of Moses. Now you see, God didn't give Moses the covenant of tithing. And the covenant of circumcision. He didn't. He made that covenant with Abraham. And so, when Moses came and brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, now they came out of Egypt because of these same covenants that existed tithing and circumcision. Now, the covenant of tithing is what binds God and the children of Israel that God will be responsible for them. God will provide for them. God will see to it that they are well taken care of. He will be El Shaddai to them. It's a covenant God made with Abraham. And, and here's the why, this is why it was a covenant. Because in a covenant, you have to give. Both parties have to give something. Please follow me now. So, God showed up in the person of Melchizedek. And the Bible said he brought bread and wine. Melchizedek came to meet Abraham, bearing bread and wine. And then the Bible says he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, the book of Hebrews tells us expressly, that this man, let, let me read it. Let's go to Hebrews. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Hebrews chapter 7, from verse 1. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now take note. Now this, this the writer of the book of Hebrews is writing from um, the place of history and revelation. Okay? Because sometimes I've seen some arguments and like I said, some of these arguments are arguments that are baseless because the people arguing have no understanding. So this is the writer of the book of Hebrews. And as of the day he wrote this book of Hebrews, this is the understanding that they have come to conclude on. Now, however they came to that understanding, I mean them now, we don't know. But then, if the Spirit of God is in you, and you fellowship with the Spirit of God for the purpose of understanding. You know, some people don't do that. How often do you go to the Lord and say, Lord, teach me this matter. Show me this matter. That's what you're supposed to as a, as a preacher, as a teacher of God's word, you should be doing that often. You don't, you know, you don't carry Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic dictionary and start tracing words. You, you will still land in error. I'm telling you the truth. I've done all those things over the years. And I found out that they don't work. Because they are all translations. It doesn't mean they give the meaning to the issue. The only way you can get the meaning of the issue is when you relate with the one who spoke. And the one who spoke is still alive today. I mean... If someone writes a book and this book is maybe 20 years old and here you are in class arguing what he meant by a statement he made simply you guys could just simply say okay you know what can we find out how to reach this author and ask him what he meant by this but you rather create factions based on different understanding of a statement the person made. And you enjoy that argument. Meanwhile, you can actually just reach out to the author and say, hey, there's this statement in your book. We're a bit confused how, wh what you meant by that statement. And the person say, oh, if you read so, so, and so, please, I had said, I had made reference to this. So this statement, you say, oh, 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 oh. And it's possible all of you are even wrong in your arguments. The same thing with these things. Jesus is alive. The Holy Spirit has been given to us for this very purpose. So if you didn't have a Bible, are you saying it would have all been useless? That's what a lot of people think, but I don't think so. I don't think so. If we didn't have a Bible, it would never have stopped the Holy Spirit from walking. Maybe the Holy Spirit would have walked more. See, when I say maybe the Holy Spirit would have walked more, maybe we would have understood better. Because you see, the problem with that the, the, the Bible have brought, and hear me, I said problem, yes. I choose my words carefully. Is the fact that men that have gone ahead of us have given us an interpretation. Now, because it's a book that exists, we kind of buy into the interpretation that was given to us. And for some reason, we neglect the Spirit of God in these matters. So you hear... Uh, people quote statements like Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And when they say that they are referring to the 66 books and I say to them, how? When Peter made that statement, there was no 66 books of the Bible. So what do you think he was referring to when he said we have a more sure word? Was he prophesying that in the future you're going to have a more sure word of prophecy? He said we have. 
He wasn't referring to any book. He was referring to the spirit of God that was reigning in their lives. But how we twist that statement to mean he says hmm. he says let the word of God dwell in you richly. That's what Colossians said. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. And then we've converted that statement to be let the Bible dwell in you richly. He said let the words of let the word of God dwell in you richly. What was he referring to? He wasn't referring to the Bible because there was no Bible when, I mean, this Bible that we have. They, ha they had Bibles then, okay? For example, they had the book that they called the Book of the Law. Now, the Book of the Law was a specific book. See? Now, well, when, when Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, he wasn't referring to a book like this because there was none. Because what was he referring to then? He was referring to, as he said, the word of Christ. The word of Christ. What the Holy Spirit is saying. Let it dwell in you richly. But then we kind of in our generation discard the voice of Christ. And we come up with all reasons. Eh? You said confusion if you just allow different people to say, God said, God said. Come on now, who's certain a confusion? You or the Lord? So, so when he said, watch this now. The writer of the book of Hebrews came to that conclusion or in their time, in their seasons, this is who they understood Melchizedek to be. Let me start from verse 1 again. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated the king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Now, he acknowledged here that this Melchizedek have been referred to by different people with different names. So there was a time he was called the king of righteousness. Then there was a time he was called the king of peace. Okay? Yeah. But then he went further to say this Melchizedek was without father, without mother, Without genealogy. Now, this was an observation. Because in the day when Melchizedek appeared to Abraham, it was assumed. Now, because you see, this, you know, I call me this for it's a party, gosh. And a kosabaliki. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In, in the days of Abraham, it was assumed that Melchizedek was a physical king that existed. But then the problem now was they couldn't find his domain. Because when he, he showed up, now he, this was not a spiritual vision. This was a physical meeting Abraham had. With Mel not only, it wasn't the only Abraham that saw him. See, his servant saw him. Different people saw him. They had a meeting. Because Abraham had to calculate the tithe of... Do you know all the things they brought from that war? And Abraham gave tithe of all. Now, that's why people confuse people say tithe was only given for crops and, and, and animals. And Who told you that? Abraham gave a tithe of all. Now, imagine a whole city was, was, um, was, was attacked and everything carried away. There were clothes there. There was money there. See? And the Bible says Abraham gave a tithe of all. Meaning, they must have calculated the, all the money they got back. And then he gave the tithe of all the money. All the clothes they got, he gave a tithe of all the clothes. All the animals, maybe. Because think about it. It would have been difficult to move animals you know, in a worse situation like that. You understand what I'm talking about? So many other things they would have carried. Now the Bible says Abraham gave a tithe of all. So animals, cash, 
um, clothes, whatever they had, all the things they had, all the expensive things, gems, all. So Abraham gave a tithe of all. And so they said, who was this man? And then they tried to trace his domain. They couldn't find his domain. Because he didn't come, I'm God. But Abraham knew him. But other people saw him as a king. This must be a king. Because he's just like a king. Another group of people saw him as a priest. This must be a priest. Because see now, see this thing he's carrying. He's priestly. So it wasn't Abraham. Because Abraham didn't give a statement that we hold on to. So all this description that he was the king of Salem. So, where is Salem? Go and check. And if, if he was a king that existed, he must have handed over to his son. So, who is his son? It was an assumption. But then, at this point, they have come to that conclusion that, hey, we traced this man had no father. This man had no mother. This man had no genealogy. But they met him. So, he says, without father, without mother, without genealogy, have a neither beginning of days nor end of life. So, when was he born? Nobody knows. When did he die? We don't know. So, where is he? We don't know. But you say you saw a king. Yes, uh, this is a soy priest. Yes. And he says, but made like the son of God. Now, this was the conclusion that he must have been the appearance of the son of God. Now, why did he say made like the son of God? I'll tell you. You remember in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay, when um, Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth man in the fire. You remember what he said? He said, the fourth man is like unto the Son of God. Praise God. My time is up. I Kaligaba I'm going to continue from here um, tomorrow. We've got a lot to talk about. Praise God. I bless you today. Your life is going in the direction God has ordained for it to go. And you will see the result of God's work in your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow.